one of the questions that I'm trying to pose to you and, and engage with um, in a broader way is why we care about Magna Carta. As one rather grumpy um, Australian scholar wrote, only a few years ago, why did we care about an old patty brown document, half burned, written in a foreign language? What, what, what can it mean to us? But quite clearly, even in the events of yesterday, where we saw our current Prime Minister, who I, I fear David Letterman was probably right, um, but a <laughs> misguided account of what Magna Carta means, um, try and capture the authority and legitimacy of that tradition to a particular moment to do with the EU and the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it was seen um, in Australia in 2001, we would have seen the Prime Minister there try and use the launch of an exhibition of their 1297 copy to project Australia's role behind America and the UK in the war on terror. If we'd been at Running Meade in 1957, both British and American ambassadors saw Magna Carta as a prophylactic against godless communism, I quote. So Magna Carta has been used as um, a, a legitimate source for authorising all sorts of contemporary debates. And what I want us to think about is how and when did that first happen? And I think one thing to always bear in the back of your mind, perhaps, is that Magna Carta was a moment, it was a historical event that happened on those water meadows in 1215. But it's also a text. It's a collection of ideas. And it's the sort of intertwining and sometimes separate use of that moment of the barons confronting the one that can be interpreted in lots of connected to a set of ideas. What we always need to remember is the 1215 Magna Carta was a peace treaty. It was not a philosophical document crafted by you know, core philosophers and theologians setting out a set of um, principles, although it did collect and combine a series of fundamental legal principles about the right to trial, the right to not to be detained, the right to property, the right to liberty of corporations. That, that was almost, and I'm very willing to be challenged, almost accidental. Um, I can give you a photograph here, taken about three years ago, showing how in one sense a group of young people um, see the space as still very important to ongoing dialogues about what is freedom, what is democracy. Um, the profound irony here is that this um, image has been used by Surrey County Council um, to represent a group of young people debating freedom. Um, it's actually a group of um, diggers um, who have occupied the, the meadow above Running Me, did so in 2012, and are still there, and actually were so being subjected to in the week running up to last um, yesterday's events, rigorous police scrutiny. And the diggers, of course, took a huge space and said, um, You're breaking the law, um, you're breaking Magna Carta, Clause 39. So there was a, a sort of living element almost. Um, so it's rather ironic. I think it's a very clever photograph of the circle. Um, and in one sense, it, it tells us something about the subversive qualities of Magna Carta. Magna Carta can be cited to authorise the rule of law, legitimate political authority. But as I'll ho hopefully discuss in a moment or two, it also legitimises resistance and protest from marginal groups. And that sort of dual tension between being a, a great image of authority but also something you cite when you don't want to be in prison or when you want to resist or call a crowd. It's very important. Um, the diggers, I think there was an interesting battle in the newspapers about a month ago. The Sunday Mail portrayed the diggers as drug-crazed, filthy hooligans. The Independent, on Monday, 
had managed to find two of the very charming young women who were at home with their small children, very immaculately dressed, cooking with their Le Creuset pots and making espresso for the visiting journalists. <laughs> There's some weird debate going on here. But that's the nature of Magna Carta. It's protean and it's malleable. It's a, one of the other sort of ways of representing what happened. Um, this is a very fine Lady Victorian doorstop. <laughs> um, you can visit and even hold us in, in church and museum. And I haven't tried, but apparently you can go on eBay and find any number of these for, for a while. Um, but why would you want Magna Carta to hold probably your door? Because I think that's one of the things we, we perhaps need to think about, the iconic value of the image or the object. I mean, if we do a store poll, how, how many people have got Magna Carta on their wall at home? Three. That's a stretch. <laughs> In the 18th century, as we all know now, lots of people would have Magna Carta in the fact, beautiful facsimile on their wall. Um, probably next to the facsimile of the death warrant, the execution of Charles I, or the Bill of Rights. Um, so there's a sort of tradition of saying, our house is saying, we've got my own regard. Um, I want to really use a lot of images to explore how Magna Carta turned from that feudal peace treaty into what, what I rather naively call a liberty document after the 17th century. How did it transform itself, or how was it transformed? Um, and I, I think we can argue very powerfully that the 17th century is the term, uh, the, the turning point um, of that moment. And it, indeed, it, this tradition is very powerful today. This is the front door, this bronze and gold of the American Supreme Court. And you can see um, there's a sort of history from antiquity all the way through. Well, we have Magna Carta, then importantly, I'm going to talk about in a bit, we have Sir Edward Cook and James I. This is an image that every American lawyer and every citizen in one sense is absolutely familiar with. So there are two Magna Carta moments inscribed in the history of American freedom. I don't want to offend any Americans who may be in the You should always remember that 1776 was not the first American Revolution, but the last British Revolution. It was British people, communities, using principles of freeborn Englishmen against what they saw as the tyranny of George III. So it's unsurprising in one sense that Magna Carta um, remains important in that context. But there the, the panels blown up a little bit for you. Um, Edward Cook, yeah. A rather failed James. And the, the scroll behind us. Rather good, I think. Um, so I want to think about how images of Magna Carta get invested with this sort of cultural power. Certainly, talk about it with Cook. Cook, armed with the Magna Carta, believes he can take on the monarchy. I mean, he was a very arrogant man and a very brave man, but he believed, armed with his erudition, he could prosecute the king for an illegal tyrannical act. Um, later on in the 18th century, John Wilkes, and we'll look at some of his images, but by citing Magna Carta, by distributing literature that showed him with Magna Carta under his arm or in his back pocket or stuck in his hat, when he needed to, when he was under threat of prosecution under a general warrant, the Magna Carta was illegal, he could mobilize 10 to 20,000 people onto the streets of London. I mean, if you think about it, that, that, that would be a real challenge even today if we were trying to protect. Um, or, or defend yourself from illegal intention. So there's something about the image 
and its connection to that tradition that's very important. Um, I think, in, in, interestingly, I don't know how many people have visited Magna Carta uh, running in different moments. It was, of course, called the Charter of Running in the first century or so, rather than Magna Carta, it's the latest sort of iterations that they have made. I, I would really recommend you go and get a little bit busy at the moment, because it's a spectacular site for public commemoration of freedom around the globe. It's not only the JFK monument, the Temple of Liberty to Magna Carta, but also the National Air Force, and we have the memorial to those fighter pilots who died um, without, without knowing. <coughs> In one sense, across those meadows, looking towards London, we have a site where people's love, people who sacrificed their life for freedom, presidents who changed seeming it like a to a friend. So it's a very evocative place. It's made even more spectacular now by the um, introduction of, of a new and very emotionally powerful uh, piece of public art called Juries that was over the place of it. Um, Twelve jury seats that you're welcome to sit on and imagine sitting in judgment. Each of them decorated with moments about freedom, liberty and democracy from 800 years, but from the globe. So Malala Yousafzai is recorded in a little bit of that. Um, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, um, a whole series of civil rights issues in, in America and in English um, and European history. So decoding that principle, I love the idea that you could travel from Pakistan and see immediately a connection between your culture and that broader global culture. You know, there is a global Magna Carta movement. The Philippines recently issued um, a charter, a Magna Carta for the poor, a statutory piece of legislation in the Philippines that will give all poor people rights to education, water, and food. So that Magna Carta brand, terrible to say, um, is increasingly powerful and manages, and this is again its protein quality I think, it manages to be amphibious across culture. And it's not regarded by say the Pakistan government as, as the tool of Western imperialism. It's regarded as a, a real state. And UNESCO of course identified it as part of the cultural memory of human life. <coughs> Um, so how did that happen? We, we know, and I'm sure um, both David Carpenter and um, earlier speakers have talked about the diffusion and the persistence of reissuing Magna Carta toward into the end of the 13th century, and probably if there's going to be something perhaps you can see with the But I'm not going to Magna Carta is a significant constitutionally shaped document really disappears from the historical picture between the 14th and the early 16th century. It's there, and, and I think some of the research that's going on in the university is dangling. It talks about how it's used in provincial society, especially in issues over regulating access to land, property, and fish. Fish are very important. I recently spoke to a group of um, eight-year-olds, a hundred of them, um, and they were very animated by Magna Carta and fishing. So I did not expect. <laughs> Maybe that's the next project to do, to with all the Anglican society, see what they feel about freedom of Magna Carta. Although it is still being cited um, in disputes in Morecambe and in North Devon over the rights of local a harvest of seafood and whatever they call the local lobster thing. Um, taking prosecutions out against the big commercial companies who just come and hoop them and all that. So, you know, it, almost every little element of Magna Carta has had some subsequent resonance down the ages. So, why did Magna Carta exercise this perdurable enchantment? You know, it's almost a political 
glamour, I think. Now, the answer to that can be sort of anthropological. Alan Ryan, the, the great political philosopher, says, well, you know, we all like to show that our opinions have been around a long time, they're almost too right. And certainly, that idea um, of buying in an important tradition is very powerful in Australasia, more so in New Zealand than perhaps in um, Australia, and in America. You know, if, if you've only landed on the, the continent a hundred years or so before, you can open that to the car and say, look, we've got 800 years of legal tradition in New Zealand. Um, so that, that sort of element of constructing an ancient constitution, you know, perhaps not always immediately obvious what the contents of that constitution are, and that's where Edward Cook is really very important in trying to populate all of that kind of idea. But that, that is one of the principles I think we even sort of see today. It must be right because it's old. And I, I was at a conference recently Plato, ask a simple question. Is it right because it's right, or is it right because it's old? Very often it's difficult to distinguish those two things. Are the principles that are in Magna Carta right because they are universally right, or do they become right because they've been sort of tuned over and accepted and adapted <coughs> and imported over 800 years? I think it's a very difficult question. Um, some of the very technical lawyers look at some of the principles and trace them back to Roman law, as we saw in that um, image there. You know, Justinian's code, very sort of crisp statements of principle we can see in Becky Dean. How did all of this change? You know, if, if we said, let me try and hold it. You know, by, by 1500, Magna Carta is a sort of you know, existing few manuscript copies, it may be in collections of statutes, but to a public audience, if there is such a thing there, it doesn't mean very much. 1508, Magna Carta gets subjected to a new technology, print. So from 1508, and this is the uh, title page opening from the British Library. Magna Carta is in print in Latin. And then the book four is translated into English. And I think you can trace really from those moments, and of course, the, the English edition gets uh, reissued dozens of times. The text also gets incorporated into something that we eventually call statutes at large, and that is reprinted into the 20th century. Um, there's now an uh, electronic version called legislation.gov.org.uk. Uh, unfortunately, if you put Magna Carta into that search, it flashes up a little label at the top. No known consequences of this law. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. And then that's because many of the key elements around detention and jury trial have been substituted by more modern legislation. But you know, the process of putting it into print was not trivial. <coughs> it meant if you were a gentleman and you came to an inner court to learn about the law, not because you wanted to be a practicing lawyer, but perhaps because you were going to retire to your provincial estate and enact justice in that locality, you buy a handbook, a textbook. You don't have all these dark rooms to go to and then you're going to find in the evening parking and drinking. Um, and the first thing you would see every time you opened your book of statues was Magna Carta. So Magna Carta sort of transformed itself, not necessarily into a constitutional document, but into a foundational statute. This is where English law starts. Now of course that rested on um, a, a rather fuzzy idea that Magna Carta wasn't innovative, it summarized and captured a, a tradition that went back into time immemorial. Yeah, that's a great sort of tactic, isn't it? 
Now, all of this is legitimate, so it goes way, way back. So far back, we can't find out what. But believe me, it did. Um, you know, if a salesman came to it to get this battery's been running for a thousand years, honestly, you, you dispute it. But that principle that Magna Carta is not innovative by simply rehearsing and renovating an old tradition is an absolutely key piece. That is the background, I think, for Edward Cook. Cook, Cook. This is Edward Cook, um, portrayed in the temple. Or do you mean in the temple? I always get confused. I mean, the portraits are all over the place because he was such a man of learning and erudition. It's almost impossible. I have the fortune of interviewing Sir Professor Sir John Baker, the eminent legal historian, who is in one sense a modern day reincarnation of and has just published in the Selden Society um, a 1604 manuscript written by Cook on Clause 39 of Magna Carta that Cook wrote in 1604 against the prerogative of James I. Well, James hadn't done anything wrong by then, <laughs> but Cook had worked out James was bringing in ideas about royal prerogative from a Scottish context. Which, of course, I'm going to claim Scottish people in the morning. Um, the Scots don't really understand the Magna Carta because they have different traditions of common law. Um, they, they prefer the Declaration of Our Road. But as I put to somebody the other day, I can see lots of people you know, citing the Declaration of Our Road in public debates or you know, in their constitutional um, laws. And, Cook recognizes as 
earlier sixteen and four. How, in one sense, the twelve fifteen chapter is a document that exposes bad statecraft. With the issues that King John was, was facing around the lack of revenue and his need constantly to be experimental about finding, the capturing of people's um, land, etc., etc., holding hostages, were confronting the early modern state in a very similar way. <coughs> I mean, it, it was a personal revelation to me to read Nick Benson's little short introduction, having read whole series of papers about the fiscal crisis um, of John, uh, James I and Charles I. Because if you were Edward Cook and had immersed yourself in Magna Carta and seen where Magna Carta was trying to restrain royal authority, and then you see James I imposing taxes on currents or selling awards or trying to steal people's forest lands, and you were a sharp looking at Straight away, he could see the parallel and he could see how Magna Carta was once again absolutely relevant text for his times. And yeah, he did, Cook held very high national office, um, and it's certainly the sense in which James tried to buy him off by giving him an office. He didn't work. James was a red man, so he was Cook. Was absolutely resolute defender of the common law and had almost an odd pleasure in taking the monarchy to court to defend that principle against the legal prerogative act. James was quite a clever manipulator of his, his court, his <coughs> parliament. His son Charles was not. And Cook really took it the um, extension of royal prerogative that Charles I pursued in the mid 1620s. Uh, famously, the forced loan, but we also need to remember that Charles was doing things like um, declaring the forest deem his forest and sending uh, the various unfortunate chaps to the forest deem saying, You need to pay us some money now. I don't know if I was born in the forest of Eden. You wouldn't want to do that today. <laughs> Never known in the 17th century. The forest of Eden, um, we said, no, I don't think so. You might be thinking of being able to go, this is our forest. Um, <laughs> if you don't like it, send some troops. Uh, which indeed did happen in the 1630s, and they lost. They came back, and Charles said, well, let's just forget that ever happened. <laughs> 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 but Cook could see the connection between that sort of conduct, forced loans, where you know, the local elites and gentry were told simply to contribute. Some of them resisted, and the 1626 forced loan case. Six members, five members were put on trial. Charles I, faithful in the state, was trying to corrupt the judicial process. He leant on the judges and he almost ordered the conviction of these things. Cook, a very, very local word, but Cook on the Zerk. This, this made not only the initial use of property a bad thing, but the fact that the king was now tampering with the due process of law, detaining free men from you know, their, their liberties and stealing their property it was a sort of triple whammy. Um, and Cook was personally involved in, in that defense. And the next thing he did, he wasn't in the league, he said, right, next parliament, uh, we're going to get the king, we're going to have to force the king to reissue Magna Carta. Um, Charles thought that was the joke at first. But do, do you know who's talking to? Uh, I'm the king, I'm appointed by God. All land in England is mine. Uh, I am the source of law, so just go away. Um, Cook was extraordinarily great and pushed and pushed and pushed. The result was the so called Petition of Right of 1628, 
that is regarded still as part of our written constitution. Jane Batchel, sorry, was very, very unhappy at being cornered and is reported to have torn the pages of the Commons Journal out um, and disposed of them. He sort of promised God that he would return at some point to the reissue of the draft, what we know from his final papers. He had absolutely no intention. Cook said, Magna Carta has no evil. Now the consequence immediately of that was that Charles I decided he could do without Parliament um, until 1640. So in one sense, Charles was forced into more and more sort of prerogative measures. Cook, surprisingly, escaped um, execution. I was Charles I, I would have had a house burnt down in him. Uh, because that was also the consequence of, of Charles's conduct, was that he ended up on trial in 1649 and was executed. Um, Cook was on his deathbed in the summer of 1634, and it was rumoured he was about to publish the second volume. It's this, I wouldn't think it would be, it's enormously long, exceptionally long. The second volume of his Institutes of Law that focused mainly on Magna Carta, but particularly on the legal home of the free man and the fraud. Charles I discovered this was going on, heard Cook was dying, and sent the body boys around, raided his study, and removed the different sort of reports to get different accounts. Fifty boxes of notes. Now, Charles I must have been a did he burn those notes? No, he stored them somewhere. <laughs> so as soon as the Civil War was on the brink of breaking out in 1641, the first thing the Free House of Commons did was demand the return of Edward Cook's notes on Magna Carta. And in 1642, I'm very fuzzy, they republished them. And we could argue that the republication of the Institute did more damage to the King's cause than many of the other thousands of pamphlets that debated the rights of kings and jurisdictions of parliaments. Because from this moment, Cook's Institute, 1642, reprinted, abridged, edited, extracted from, turned into tiny little pamphlets with the so-called golden passages extracted. With their new model army copies into the 18th century um, in the colonies, every sort of court would have a copy of Cook. So Cook defined in one sense what become known as English liberty. Or in the tradition of this individual, John Lilburn, freeborn John, we can talk either about English liberties or the liberties of freeborn. And what we can see is it becomes an incredibly powerful resource to resist tyranny. It mobilizes much of the new model army's political thinking about why Charles I is a tyrant and how he can be resisted by citing the native, <coughs> natural, ancient freedoms of Englishmen. And it's that tradition that. <laughs> <laughs> it's that tradition, and, and I think if we, um, you know, John Lilburn was constantly put on trial, both by Charles I in the late 1630s, but also by the new Commonwealth regime, he didn't like Cromwell either. Um, and he was very good at mobilising his public image to defend himself. And here he is, holding Cook's Institutes. And one of the fantastic sort of continuities around Magna Carta is that when John Wilkes, the 18th century radical, was put on trial, he was presented with John Milburn's copy of Edward Cook's Institutes to show and display when he was in the court. So that tradition of the rule of law, all of these men are defending the rule of law, but Magna Carta seen through the Cookian lens becomes also a defense of resistance. 
Okay, it's, it's quite difficult for us. Do we have any brain noise out there today? Mm. Yeah, who would stand up and take the government to court? But Cook, I mean, Cook could have been executed very, very easily. He'd spend time in his hour, um, But he believed in his principles. He was incredibly learned. And he survived. His ideas and uh, people in the 1650s, Quakers, Famously, um, in the 1680s, a man called Henry Care produced a book called English Liberties that sort of did an abridgment of bits of Cook, almost with um, tear-out bits. You know, if somebody approaches you and wants to rough you up with this, tear this out, hand it to them and sign it, you can go to this legal or to that thing. Henry Care's sort of channeling of Cook goes all the way through to the American Revolution. It's reprinted in Boston and in various other places in the 1760s and 1770s. So we can see that continuity of the Cookian defense of the rule of law, but also it, it's used somehow as a, a marker of resistance. Now, I realize I'm not much too much, so we'll just look at some pictures that will try and instantiate this tradition. I mean, there, there is a wonderful book by Bowen Bailey called The Archaeological Origins of the American Revolution that really details a lot of the technical publications. But at one point in 1680, William III is aware of Magna Carta. They're arguing about whether we should put Cook's Golden Passages up on every guild hall in England in gold so that everybody, if they walk to school or walk to work, can see those things. Now, I mentioned before the iconography, of course, and this is deeply ironic, um, hardly anybody had seen the original Magna Carta. Cook had had access to the Cotton Library. Um, by the 1730s, again, the printing of the Cotton, they are making these beautiful reproductions. Of course, all, all, all of this baronial stuff is in there. Uh, Printer's edition, and you'll notice here the sort of reproduction of the burnt seal as you can see it today. This is incredibly expensive, it's still in Latin, and it's part of that, what can we call it, making a document ubiquitous. You know, it, it is now no longer possible not to know what man can call it. I don't know why I can do that. Here is the, the famous John Burns, um, notoriously the earliest man in England. The artist thing giving some favours here. Um, Magna Carta in the scroll, Magna Carta in the scroll, Hercules defeating the Hydra of the Central Freedom. Everybody who was a Whig wanted their portrait taken in this way. This is one of the British Museum fantastic collection. This is Wells again, but it's a of books. Um, so, there are ceramics and wilts, there's a consumer culture that uses Magna Carta to defend English liberty. In even the level of tea pots and tea services. <laughs> um, Edmund Burke's, I think his strange wife, wanting to annoy him, commissioned a set of tea cups and teapots with Tom Penn. <laughs> 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 Um, this is a really important one. This is Arthur Beardmore, um, a, a colleague of John Wells, a, a radical alderman of London and a lawyer, who had been writing scholars things about the war of courts and was going to be subjected to a legal arrest under a general warrant. So he very cleverly asked the same engraver who produced the facsimile of um, the Magna Carta for to produce this so he could have it available when he was about to be arrested. And this at print, you can buy copies today, they printed up so many of them. You can buy them today very inexpensively. So Beardmore is presented, you can't quite see it, but his finger pointing at clause 39. Mm. No free man shall be taken. This is your old son, with a finger in the Bible. Learning the tradition of freedom from his father, 
but learning it from a text which is almost certainly cross institute because it's slightly too early for a black center to be very widely known. Now, I can't read the biblical text here, but essentially it's saying it's really important to teach your children about traditions of truth and freedom. And that, you know, obviously today we can arrange for the sky needed to be there, so we can to arrest the songs or something. But, but that image of continuity, passing on the tradition, is even still out of today, I think. It was Gordon Brown who talked about the, the chain of gold, the golden chain of liberty and running in to you know, democracy. And there were these debates about can we use Magna Carta to teach British citizenship? They thought it was a good If you don't have Magna Carta, this is what happens to you. <laughs> a free born Englishman, exclamation mark. Um, he's standing on Magna Carta, he's shackled, he has no free speech. This is what will happen if you let the French go. <laughs> These are just a few representations of what I like to think of as our informal constitution. But this really survives into the 20th century. So here we have the artifacts of our liberty, all kept in a chest. And we have Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, habeas corpus. Um, I mean, we never decoded what this one was, but it could well be Cook's Institute on that. Um, but that notion of a collection of documents holding and representing your freedoms and rights as a constitution is very important. It's even better sort of representation. These are the laws of England. Um, nice pyramid, um, Magna Carta is here, Bill of Rights, Habeas Corpus, Scales of Justice, Union Jack. This is from about 1820. So that tradition is, is written into our hearts, the world view of that. Even better, constitutional architecture. But this is the 1890s. Um, and again, Magna Carta, Bill of Rights, trial by jury, it's the same old stuff, habeas corpus. I'll read that one. Blackstone. Oh, Blackstone, even better, the addition of Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest. And most importantly, and this is really the last thing I'll talk about, and we can have some questions. They're connected these sort of native, contingent, British tradition of freedom with the state of manumission and the capital liberty that would give sl slaves their freedom in antiquity. So it's made it a universal principle. Um, this is, of course, an very wrong. So they, in particular, lawyers misbehave. They pull down the pillars. You know, this is the model of the Temple of Liberty that exists at Rome and in Canada. Notice Liberty toppling, holding on to the same there. So it's quite dramatic and interesting iconography, much more subtle than the sort of political cartoons we see today. I, I've almost stopped soon. This is um, this one. It's the wax model for a medal that they wanted to produce in the 1780s, the Royal Society of Arts prepared this. And again, it makes the connection I just mentioned between the contingent moment, that Magna Carta moment, on the fields of running. This is a representation of John sealing the Magna Carta with liberty, the goddess of liberty, holding the state of manumission and the capital freedom. But on one side of the coin, you have that moment of running. And on the other side of the coin, you have the Freedoms that it established. Th these are just some of the slightly more exotic um, versions of Magna Carta in the 19th century, where you see the one some tatting called printing thing. Um, Earl Spencer produced this unbelievably ornate um, text. This, this is just one of the most beautiful pieces of printing I have ever seen. This is an attempt failed by the Royal Society of Arts. Use a new technique, printing in gold, on satin. And they put out a call um, for 10 minutes. You can have your gold copy of Magna Carta printed on either 
white satin, purple satin, or uh, red satin. How many do they sell? <laughs> this is the only bit that survives. This is another bit of the uh, Spencer one. This is a fantastic sort of image. Again, Britannia holding Magna Carta and the scales of justice. English liberties, brilliant. Religion, morality, and loyalty, happiness. French liberty, atheism, poetry, mad, mad sort of behaving you know, people. But I don't quite understand in this list. Um, I can understand misery. But one of the bad things is that French freedom does is really quite These are just images from when Magna Carta was in America and when the British uh, Temple was opened in 1957. Magna Carta became a civil rights document in the 1960s, both in America and in England. The famous case of the Mango Nine, where Doctor Howe was still with us um, and his lawyer, uh, nine of the people in the Mango British State Department in court of the Afro Caribbean community were going to turn into the Black Panthers and start shooting people. This was not the case. They were more interested in music and the food. Um, so, Darkest Howe in the court said, Magna Carta says we should be tried by our equals. There are no black jurors. Well, we don't need black jurors. So from that moment, all of the um, accused spoke in Jamaican patois. And the judge and the lead one said, we can't understand what you're saying. So, well, if you were Welsh, you'd make sure they were Welsh jurors. So they did eventually get two black jurors on, on the um, jury. And this, this was the great tour of 1976, organized by former Prime Minister um, John Major, who's in a, a negative for American Express. And Magna Carta was amazing. Articulated his own glory, the empty on the side, was driven around um, America with these outriders, and everywhere it went, it was like, and maybe showing my age, the eagles were arriving in the No, it was the Lincoln copy of Magna Carta, and people flocked to watch it. Um, that's our current Prime Minister, not no one Magna Carta. Um, this, this is to do with refugees in uh, Australia. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty. Did the Magna Carta reach Australia? So, both people drank in that. Um, now let's get the online version. <laughs> Tim, you're going to be of course, trying to do that at the moment. Um, that's just a bit of self regard from the various events that are going on at the moment. But I want to leave you with this is the best. <laughs> I've got a problem with the Lee Price action, Magna Carta, builds the roots and so quite a problem. It is wonderful. You. There's another one. Empty and snail and harm us the wild by the pens. Magna Carta, Article 61, the national natural toilet. Interestingly, and this is where the medieval world can come back and find modernity. Clause 61, so called enforcement clause that John really was created a council of 25 barons that would enforce his following of the principles of Magna Carta. Um, he never received much people, but these occupied people of the sky and did indeed persuade the baron in the House of Lords to support their attempt to invite the Queen to dismiss the entire government. So Magna Carta is still at the step of their attempt, very, very funny, but historically, yeah. So I ain't finished. Um, I just leave you with that. A bomb was going to kill my father.